Hi, everyone in Orange County. This is Diane Kelly and Melissa Bourbon, and we are uh, both authors and members of the Friends of the Orange County Library. And we're here to talk to you today about 20 tips for better writing. Um, with this horrible virus going on, a lot of people are reconnecting with some of their um, passions and interests. And we know some of you are aspiring writers and uh, maybe could use some tips to make your writing better. And we are more than happy to share what we've learned through our long roads um, to publication with you. And just a little bit about me, I um, have been writing for about 20 years now. I have three published series. My first series was my Death and Taxes series which um, starred an IRS agent who went after white collar criminals. It's a funny kind of cozy mystery crime caper series. And it drew on my former life as a tax advisor. They say, write what you know. And so I did. Uh, my next series is my pawn enforcement series, which is still ongoing. I've got eight books out in this series. Um, so if you're into binge reading, this would be a good one to binge as well as the Death and Taxes series. This is set in Fort Worth, Texas, where I used to live. And it stars a female police officer who works with a female um, canine. And I do chapters from the dog's point of view, which are a lot of fun. And my most recent um, uh, release is my House Flipper series. There's two books in this series out. It's set in Nashville, Tennessee, and it stars a female carpenter who flips houses with her cousin. And she, of course, has a cute little cat named Sawdust. Uh, and I'm Melissa Bourbon, and like Diane, I've been writing for a long time. Um, started seriously writing for the goal of publication about 17 years ago, and I have three series as well, and also some standalones. So my first series <clears throat> is the Lola Cruz Mystery Series, which is a caper mystery. Um, there are five books total, and at this point, the series is complete. Um, that takes place in Sacramento, California. I have the Magical Dressmaking Mystery Series. This is book two, A Fitting End Begins with Pleading for Mercy. A lot of cozy mysteries have punny titles, and so this is one of those. Um, this takes place in a fictional town of Bliss, Texas. I used to live in Texas as well, so that's a setting for this one. Um, the third series, which is ongoing, is Needed to Death, and it's or is a, a bread shop mystery series. The first book is Needed to Death. Um, there are four out now. The fifth one comes out this later this year, and then three more in the works. And then I have a couple of standalones, some romantic suspense books, and a light paranormal romance. So been writing a long time, have a lot of books under my belt as well. And we're very happy to be here with you today and sharing some writing tips. So our, our first tip is something, you know, that we heard when we first started writing too, and it's show, don't tell. So tip number one is show, don't tell. Um, an example of that is if you were telling somebody um, about someone being angry, you might just say, Jimmy felt angry or Jimmy looked angry. Well, that's not all that exciting. It's more exciting to say, you know, Jimmy stomped his foot or he punched the wall and, and felt the scrape of the bricks on his knuckles and his knuckles began to bleed. Right. That's a lot more interesting when you're actually showing that Jimmy is angry. So when you're writing, make sure that you're doing that. Make sure that you are are showing, not telling. And if you want just a couple little quick um, exercises to do, translate these things that are telling into a way that it's showing. So what if somebody told you Brittany was heartbroken? How could you show that Brittany was heartbroken? How could you show that a dog was sleepy? How could you show that mom was confused or that Dakota was scared? So those are some exercises you can do if you want to try this um, showing rather than telling. Okay, and tip number two goes right along with the showing and telling um, tip, which is to use active voice rather than passive voice. And that means to have your subject actually doing an action versus the action being done upon um, an object. So, for example, you might say the basketball was picked up by my brother. Well, that something is being done to that basketball by the subject rather than the subject doing the actual action, which would be my brother picked up the basketball. So active voice versus passive voice. Um, there are times when passive voice is appropriate, and that would be you know, when you are trying to soften the blow or slow down the pacing, or um, if you have somebody that's trying to deny 
culpability. For example, um, they might say mistakes were made versus I made a mistake. Um, you failed the test versus saying a passing score was not achieved. So the difference is um, it's important to note what you're trying to accomplish with a scene or a sentence and, and how that's going to play out. But generally speaking, you want to stick with as much active voice as you can. That's a great tip. Our third tip is to choose the best point of view for your writing. And there's really two aspects of point of view. You have the point of view that you have to choose whether you're going to write in first person or third person. And then there's point of view, um, choosing which character's point of view, whether it be in first person or third person that you're going to tell the story from. So first person point of view, of course, is I. I did this. I did that. I saw this. And I tend to write a lot in first person because my um, stories are very character driven. And I love getting into the character's head and basically becoming the character as I write. And um, so it's great for stories that are very character driven, um, for stories where um, you really want to get inside a person's point of view. A downside, though, to first person is that it can be somewhat limiting. Um, for instance, in my Death and Taxes series, you know, I have my, my IRS agent going after the white collar criminals and she can only know what she knows. And that's all she can tell the reader is what she knows. So there may be things happening that the reader is not aware of and the character is not aware of. So it, it can be a little limiting in that way and be a little tricky and maybe make your writing a little more difficult. Um, the third person is where, um, you know, he, she, it, did this, said this. Um, and so that's a little more open and you can have limited third person where it's just sort of one person's perspective, which again, you know, has the same problems as the first person that you're only getting one person's point of view, or you can have omniscient where, um, you're writing it at knowing everybody's point of view and from different point of views. But even if you do omniscient, sometimes you want to have one character that your readers can kind of glom onto. That's your primary point of view. Mm -hmm. And um, you want to make sure that um, it's somebody that your reader um, can empathize with. If your primary point of view character, and this is kind of, I'm shifting now into whose point of view you want to want to write from, whether you choose first or third, is you do need to make that person somebody that your character or that your readers can relate to, somebody who's empathetic, um, that they um, can understand that, um, um, doesn't have to be a perfect person. I mean, there's things like shows like Breaking Bad where, you know, the main character, Walter White, was anything but a perfect person. But you could still relate to him because he was trying to take care of his family. He was doing wrong things for the right reasons. OK, so um, so make sure that when you pick your point of view character that you're picking one that your readers are going to like. And I actually do a lot of playing with point of view in my books. Um, in my Death and Taxes series, I do strictly uh, my IRS agent's point of view and that's it. Then when I started writing uh, my Paw Enforcement series, I had gone to a writer's workshop and somebody talked about how fun it is to write from the villain's point of view. And I thought, well, that sounds for fun. You know, and you can build suspense that way if you're writing a mystery or, or crime novels. So I thought, well, I'm going to try that. But I also had a dog in here and I wanted to write from the dog's point of view. So I do first person point of view from the female police officer. I do third person point of view writing in the dog's point of view. The dog doesn't talk, but you get in the dog's head. Um, and then I do third person point of view um, from the villain's point of view, and I wrote those. So you can do a lot of creative things like that and have some fun with point of view. I think it's incredibly fun when we get to read Sawdust's point of view and the dog's point of view. And the yeah, that's that's a fun little. Yeah, I do the cat's point of view. Yeah, and yeah. The readers and the reviews people say that they like that too. So that so that's something to think about if you feel like you know, wow, I'm not sure. I want to play with these different points of view. Um, and sometimes you know that third person can give you a little bit of distance, like. Like when I first started writing the dog's point of view, um, I was writing that in first person too. One of my critique partners said, you know, it makes the dog sound just a little unrealistic and too smart to be first person. Mm. He suggested I change it to third. And that was a great tip. That's why having other writers, uh, Melissa and I now, we exchange things and get um, tips from each other and, and feedback because it's so important. It's hard to be sometimes objective, objective about your work. So yeah. it's important yeah. to be objective about it and give you some feedback. And I think, um, just piggybacking on that, that it's important to experiment and write a scene in first person, write a scene in third person, see what works for you, how your voice develops with that scene, depending on the point of view. Um, you know, because you might have a, a, a um, strength in writing in one versus another that you might not know about if you never try the other one. All right, and then uh, tip number four, then, is remembering or writing to your audience. So. 
I don't know if all of you know this, but most people read at a sixth grade reading level. Um, newspapers, journalism typically is written at that grading level. Um, and then, you know, actually don't read. So you have to keep those things in mind when you're writing. That does not mean to dumb down your writing at all um, and use plenty of $20 words, but also keep in mind that you want to make your writing very accessible to whoever your audience is. You want to meet readers' expectations, and that means giving them what they want. Um, in romance writing, for example, there's an expectation of a happily ever after, and so you want to make sure that you give the reader that happily ever after. With mysteries, which Diane and I write, we want to make sure that justice is served at the end because that's the reader expectation that we've provided a puzzle for the reader to try to solve right alongside the sleuth hopefully we stump the reader along the way but that in the end justice is served um, people read to escape especially when they're reading fantasy sci-fi because these are completely different worlds that don't exist or some alteration of our current world um, so understand that if you're writing sci-fi or fantasy that you need to provide that otherworldly experience so that your reader can escape into it. Um, think about your writing as a product. What are you giving your reader in the end? And so that's that's just a really important thing to keep in mind as you proceed with whatever your project is. There are a couple of exceptions like one thing I thought of with the, with the justice was Gone Girl. Do you remember how many people were upset about the ending of that? I I just threw the book across the room. I was like, this did not yeah. meet my expectations. I was angry about it. So, you know, you don't generally want to do that to people. There are some exceptions to it. Probably to every rule we're telling you, there are some exceptions. But by and large, you're not going to be able to get away with that. And, and it's much better to give people what they came for and not leave them Especially them. when you're writing genre fiction, where mm -hmm. there is a very firm expectation. Yeah. yeah. Like like sci-fi, like mystery, like cozy mystery or any sub um, sub category within a genre. Yeah, def definitely. Um, the fifth tip is to make sure that you mix narrative and dialogue. If you have too many um, long paragraphs that are really heavy with narrative with no dialogue to break it up, it's going to make the book feel heavy and it's going to probably slow down the pacing. If you have too much dialogue, it's maybe not going to read naturally. Or, um, you know, there's, there's just limits to what you can do with dialogue. Sometimes dialogue doesn't move a plot forward. It can do it a little bit. You can put little, you know, tips and clues and things that are happening in dialogue. But sometimes you just, you've got to have that action going on and that's going to be in the narrative. So make sure you mix that up a little bit. And I've heard of some people, you know, saying that, you know, editors will look at a book and they'll go through and they'll, they'll look to see if it has some white spaces. And yeah. if it looks too dense, they'll say, oh, well, that's too much narrative. No, you know, and, and the readers will even do that too. They'll kind of look because it, it's intimidating when there's too many big thick blocks of narrative so make sure that you mix it up good tip all right number six is to employ themes to unify your writing so have you ever heard someone tell you about something that happened and then when they're done with the story you're like okay but what was the point it's the same thing with a book if there is no unifying theme the book might be okay but maybe not super memorable or not having a level of depth that maybe you're after or that the reader's going to really respond to. So you want to think about a theme that unifies the dialogue, the plot, um, the characters and their actions so that it comes together and adds depth to whatever it is you're writing. So for my books, I almost always have a theme of relationships, female relationships, grandmothers, daughters, aunts, friends, um, strong women. And then, of course, because I write mysteries, typically there's also this, this theme of justice. And so these themes intertwine throughout um, every element of the book. And then, Diane, what are some of the themes that you tend to tackle? So I, I do a lot of redemption. I, I like people, um, um, you know, turning themselves around. You know, I feel like it's never too late for us to turn ourselves around. And, and I, I love stories like that, like A Christmas Carol is one you know, that has a big redemption theme. Some of my stories have those. Um, justice, like you mentioned, all mysteries have that. Revenge is another common one in um, mysteries and thrillers and suspense, like The Princess Bride, you know, you killed my father. And, <laughs> and you can have multiple themes because you can have a theme, for, you know, what's propelling your mystery forward if you're writing a mystery, but then if you've got a romantic element, what's the theme that's that's um, behind that romance that's developing? So your, your book's not going to have just one theme, um, but you do want to have themes to tie things together and to, again, to create that depth. 
Um, some examples we have for you, we're just going to go back and forth a little bit on this um, to give you examples. So Lord of the Flies, The Life of Pi, and The Walking Dead all have, for example, survival themes. And then in um, 1984 in Huckleberry Finn, you have the individual versus society. That's a theme. Okay, and the theme of war, two examples are Gone with the Wind, War and Peace, you know, uh, Game of Thrones, <laughs> it's constant war. So, yeah, that's a pretty common theme. Yeah, love is a theme in Romeo and Juliet and Pride and Prejudice. Death is a theme in The Fault of Our Stars, the Harry Potter books. Good versus evil is a big one in um, a lot of books. Uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, superhero stories, Game of Thrones, which is mm -hmm. uh, super popular um, one. The good versus evil is, is probably one of the most basic ones, I would say. Yeah, and again, in the Harry Potter books, so there you see death is a theme, but good versus evil is a theme. So you have multiple themes in any one work. Um, let's see, coming of age, the perks of being a wallflower, the catcher in the rye, a tree grows in Brooklyn, Brooklyn little women especially for young adult fiction. Yeah, yeah, that's real common in this. Um, Power and Corruption, you've got that in Lord of the Rings, Macbeth, Hunger Games, Animal Farm. Mm -hmm. Courage and Heroism, The Hobbit, one of my favorites, Robin Hood, Percy Jackson books. And you've got Prejudice and To Kill a Mockingbird, The Hate You Give, and Frankenstein. And The Princess Bride, again, has another theme um, of revenge, which we talked about. And then uh, revenge and, uh, or excuse me, redemption and justice in, in mysteries, like a, or a Christmas Carol was an example I gave of redemption, but um, there's other ones too in mysteries too, where, where you know, criminal might come around and yeah. you know, decide to, to finally behave. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so tip number seven is to write in your unique voice. Uh, we all speak a little differently. Um, we use different phrases. We use different pacing. Some of us use longer sentences. Some of us use shorter sentences. And there's no one right way to communicate. So make sure you're communicating in a way that is natural for you, that is in your voice. Because if you try to force a voice, if you try to, to emulate somebody else, it's going to come off is unnatural and it's going to be difficult for you to do and I can I can say this from experience when I was uh, before I was published I was trying to kind of figure out who I who am I as a writer and mm -hmm. at that time you know I have, I have a very chiclet voice chiclet was on the down downturn it was hard to sell chiclet but those dark paranormals were real popular so I tried to write a dark paranormal and I just couldn't do it it was not it was not my voice um as far as um you know voice can also mean sort of your personality on the page and mm -hmm. that was not my personality i don't have um you know that that dark side to um myself to write that kind of thing and i just i love to write funny stuff um but my voice also is very straightforward i don't use a lot of fancy language um it's very you know, pretty simple and I, I very casual i have a critique partner um named angela who's a great writer she's very intellectual her stuff comes off that way it's it's very um uh, flowery language, flowery in a good way, um, and it comes off as very intelligent um, writing. And her sentences tend to be longer with a lot more clauses. So we, we, are, we are night and day as far as what we write. She does a lot of great fantasy. She can be good at the at the dark stuff, but also the light stuff. So it's just, you know, a, a matter of discovering who you are, but, but writing it as you are. Put your personality on the page through your voice. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with that more. Um, all right. Next, uh, this is our eighth tip, is to vary your word choices. And we're so lucky that we're not writing, you know, 100 years ago because we can just right click on a word and there's your definition and your thesaurus with other options. Um, but that and that's a great tool. So you want to think about which is more interesting. And this goes back to the showing versus telling. Uh, the more descriptive your writing and your words, the the better the image is that the reader is going to be getting. So for example, um, Andy was tired, tired to the bone. He was so tired he went to bed and slept for 12 hours and when he woke up, he was still tired. Okay, we Andy's tired, we get it. <laughs> or we can be a bit more creative and say Andy was sleepy, weary to the bone. He was so exhausted he went to bed and slept for 12 hours and when he woke up, he was still lethargic. So it's not a matter of which is better per se, but which is more descriptive, which creates a stronger image for the reader. And that's what you want to do. Um, that said, words can be repeated for effect. So if you're going to repeat a word in a paragraph, in a sentence, um, even in a scene, but you can do that if you have intention and you're going for some sort of stylized um, um, 
reason. So for example, it was a day for color, not just one color, but many. The color of Sandra's lips, the color of Ed's worn blazer, the color of sea and sand and sky. And that's an example from Dwight Swain's Techniques of the Selling Writer, um, which is a great book for any aspiring writer. Um, but you can see he uses the word color repetitively, but with a purpose. So just be aware of your word choice and use a thesaurus as much as you can, but make sure that the words that you choose are words that you know and that fit also with the style of your writing. And just to, as you want to vary your word choices, our ninth tip is to vary your sentence structure and length. If all of your sentences are very short, it can start reading like C. Dick runs, C. Jane jump, you know, and it's kind of boring. If they're all very long, it can feel cumbersome and people can feel kind of overwhelmed by all these long sentences. So you want to vary it a little bit. You can use fragments. It's perfectly okay to do that. Um, I actually have, um, in one of my books, I have a one word paragraph and it's just the word busted, you know, after the cop caught somebody. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so play with your sentence structure and length and that'll, that'll keep things, you know, interesting for the reader and it'll, it'll sound better. Yeah. I agree. Um, and then tip number 10 then, which goes right alongside your sentence structure and your sentence length is to use appropriate pacing. So bad pacing can kill a story. If your pacing is too slow, especially you know all the way through, that you haven't created any variety, your readers can get bored. They can just, you know, it's slogging along and they can just lose interest. Um, conversely, if you have writing that is short and choppy all the way through, maybe action packed, maybe keeping the reader going, 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 they never have time to slow down and take a breath. You need to give the reader both opportunities. So uh, pacing that is varied, as Diane just said, and with intent so that you're moving the story along, you're building tension, but then you're also allowing your reader time to kind of slow down and catch up. Um, so when it's when you're wanting to move things along, <clears throat> build suspense, use shorter sentences. Know when enough is enough. Um, so you had an example about when your editor wanted you to take out a stakeout scene, is that right? Yeah, she said that it went on too long, you know, and I was I was trying to kind of make the point come across that the stakeout got boring and, mm -hmm. and, and my writing got boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. drew it out a little too long. So that was, it, it actually a few of my reviews said that too, even after editing. So I, I learned something from that. If your character's bored, don't try to make your readers bored too. You got to find yeah, a way yeah. to make that without. Well, you know, I mean, a lot of it is learning from doing, right? Right, right. I had a few times my editor said, your ending felt kind of rushed. You know, when I turned it in, I thought, well, it was rushed because the deadline came up. And yeah. I had to, you know, but people want to savor the, the endings and mysteries. They want to savor that justice, that sense of, yay, justice was done. And we're going to kind of celebrate the that the case was solved and all that. So Right. It's not they got the bad guy at the end. Yeah. Right. So, okay. So when you're uh, writing action scenes, you want to keep your sentences shorter, choppier. He ran, he hurtled the fence. The dog took off, took off after him, caught him, bit him. He screamed in agony. That is pumping up the action, pumping up the suspense for your reader. And then you turn around and use longer sentences, like we just mentioned, to slow things down. Um, you can also use dialogue and dialogue or dialogue tags in between dialogue and narrative in between pieces of dialogue to slow the pacing. So you could say, um, I'm going to the store. I need to get brownie mix. I need to get eggs. I'm going to make those brownies. You could slow it down by saying, I'm going to the store. Susan said. She paused, considered her list. I need to get milk. I need to get brownie mix. I need to get eggs. Completely different tone of what's going on in that scene because you've slowed it down. So just being aware of your sentence structure and, and how it affects your pacing is really, really important. I think that'd be more like the first example where if there's brownies involved, I want them now. Yeah. <laughs> get them. Okay, well, Susan, get those brownies made. <laughs> The eleventh tip is to give each of your pieces a catchy title, and, and as uh, Melissa mentioned earlier, you know a lot of cozy mysteries have have funny titles. You know, needed to death, flower in the attic. There's a reason why, um, and it's flower F L O U R for her bread making. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's a reason why they do that when it when it's cute and catchy and fun, or, or at least catchy. It can even be catchy in a creepy way. But but it's got to be catchy to get the reader's attention. You're competing against other books, other news articles, you know, whatever you're writing, other poems, um, 
uh, so you want to make sure that you draw the reader's attention to your work so that you'll get readers. Um, you know, because people's time is valuable and you mm -hmm. want to make sure that you give them, um, you know, a, a title that's going to bring them in. And the first thing that I ever sold was an article that I wrote for a family magazine. I got $40 for it, but it was all about how I'd use my gingerbread man cookie cutter to make sugar cookies for my daughter's soccer team. And I decorated the sugar cookies to look like all the team members. So I had different hair color on them, different eye color, um, you know, their jersey numbers on the cookies. And I called that article Getting Personal with the Gingerbread Man. And that was a little more attention grabbing than just, you know, alternate uses for your gingerbread man cookie cutter, right? So be yeah. sure to give a title. Yeah, yeah, that's a great. Uh, all right, next is to know the rules of grammar as much as you possibly can, and then know when to break them. So editors, especially now, they don't want to have to work very hard. They want pieces that are as complete and as polished as possible. So you need to be grammatically correct, but, and this is especially true in nonfiction. In fiction, you have more leeway, um, but you want things to be following grammatical rules, especially in your narrative portions. Dialogue is a bit of a different uh, tack that you can take, but nonfiction should all pretty much always follow the rules. Um, when you're talking about poetry, that's completely different. So you have leeway to do it, really whatever you want with grammar. Um, but with novels, um, again, your narrative, you can follow grammar rules, although you can have fragments. Um, you can have just one word to punch something up or to give real import to something. Um, your dialogue is when you can break those rules most often because you don't want to speak, have your character speak with perfect grammar because we do not speak with perfect grammar. And so if you do that, then it's going to come across as very inauthentic. So um, you can have your character say, yeah, I seen him or me and Susie went to the store, even though that's not grammatically correct. It should be Susie and I. But that's not how we talk. So follow the rules when necessary, but break the rules when it's appropriate, especially when you're talking about dialogue. That's a good one. Okay, our 13th tip is to state concepts positively rather than negatively. And what I mean by that, and the best way I can do it is give you an example. Instead of saying, I don't like strawberry ice cream as well as Rocky Road, okay, you have to think about that for a minute, right? Okay, she doesn't like strawberry as well as Rocky Road. That means she likes Rocky Road better than strawberry. It's just more clear to say, I like Rocky Road better than strawberry ice cream, right? It's so that's just kind of a quick little tip, but it, it'll just make your writing easier if you state your concepts positively rather than negatively. Yeah, that's a good tip. I hadn't really ever thought about that until we started yeah. working on these. Yeah, one of those weird ones that just came out of the blue one time that I heard, I thought, oh, that really, that makes a point. Yeah, that makes good sense. Uh, all right, so next, which is tip number 14, is to evoke all of the senses, um, five or six, depending on how you how, how you count your senses, <laughs> um, which means to make us see, and this goes right along with uh, showing versus telling. If you use your five senses, you are going to be showing a scene versus telling us about it. So use the senses of sight, smell, hear, hearing, taste, and feel for your characters and scenes, um, and even intuition which is that sixth sense uh, when it's appropriate so in Diane you have a you had an example in one of your opening scenes of paw enforcement where there was you can tell us about that so you had a lot of onomatopoeia you know and sounds going on in there yeah in this book there's a bomber planting bombs around Fort Worth and the first one that goes off is in a food court in a mall and it's been placed in the garbage can so you can imagine what all was in that garbage can and when that explodes what's going to happen there's going to be like basically a food fight going on in there so I had you know pizza sticking through a window and you know salad hitting over there and something else hitting over there so I had you know all this onomatopoeia like splut glit you know and then things were you know breaking and falling before tinkle crinkle Splat, look, you know, just all these kind of um, sounds that, and smells too, you know. So going into the food court, when I describe that, you know, going in there and smelling all the different smells of the food court. And, and I use smell a lot in my bread shop mysteries because it, the central kind of location is a bread shop where everything is centered around. Um, and so there's always bread baking and, you know, different, different baked goods. And so I get to describe them, and a lot of that comes back to the smell. And I have readers saying, oh, I, I, and I, I made me hungry or I, I want some bread or, you know, I get comments like that quite a bit because I do tap into that sense a lot. Which and effectively, is obviously, too, if they're saying you made them hungry. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, so the next thing you want to do, this is our tip number 15, is to employ hooks. And basically what hooks are is just a way to pull your reader along through the story. You know, you don't want them to stop at any point. So you basically kind of always have to leave something unanswered. Always leave a question open, you know, end your chapters on cliffhangers. Um, uh, you don't necessarily want to end the book on a cliffhanger. Sometimes in series, people do that to get you to get, go to the next book, but that can be frustrating for readers. Cause again, that goes back to the reader's expectations, but, but ending a chapter on one, then they're kind of like, well, I don't want to end this mm -hmm. chapter. You know, I want to go to the next chapter now. So always try to leave, you know, if you answer one question, raise another one or leave another one unanswered to keep people um, going, going along. And you don't want to feed them everything all at once too. Like with backstory on your characters, you don't want to go, okay, here's Susie. She was born and raised in this town and this is how she feels, blah, blah, blah. And now Susie goes forward to do the action. You want to just, you know, start with Susie doing some action. Tell us a little bit about Susie, you know, tease us along on who is she really and, mm -hmm. and why is she this way and give us a little bit throughout the book to keep us going. And I think I just thought of this. It's kind of like when you're making a new friend. You don't just sit there and give your whole entire life story to that friend. You start with some commonality that you have. That's where that friendship is based, you know, initially. And then as you get to know each other more, some little tidbit is revealed about you or them and, and over and over. I mean, my husband told me something. I don't know, a couple of days ago that I was like, wait, we've been married for 30 years and I did not know that, you know? So you release little tidbits along the way, just as you are when you develop new relationships. Keep things in. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so then number 16 is to use words that evoke mood. So instead of saying her dress was orange, you could say it was the hue of a brilliant sunset. Um, you could say that something is haunting and the clouds were dark and ominous if you're trying to create a suspenseful mood. So using words and choosing things that are going to help evoke a mood or tone for your book is really critical. If you have some heavy suspense happening, you probably don't want it to be a bright, sunny, gorgeous day unless you're doing that for some very specific reason. You want moods and, and um, tone words that are going. Are you live? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> that was our comic relief. <laughs> um, anyway, words, words that are going to help to build the tone um, or the mood that you're going for in that particular scene. Not to get like refocused. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure our, our viewers can relate. They've probably all been doing things with their their jobs and head issues. Yeah. Like, I'm, like, I'm like I and my cats right now. Thank goodness they're all sleeping because otherwise I know, they're my dogs too. You can see them. <laughs> so tip number seventeen is to write precisely, and that's all about word choice. Pick the most precise words that you can. Okay, because for one, it helps with pacing if you're not using more words than you need to convey a message, but it also just makes your writing more interesting. So for example, if I said, the woman crossed the road, think about what image you're getting in your mind, okay? Maybe you're not getting a very clear image because honestly, that's not a very clear sentence. But what if I said in, instead, the co-ed darted across the university's main drag? Okay, well, that's the same as the woman crossed the road, but I'm giving you a lot more precise detail and precise using more precise words. Or maybe I said, the grandmother strolled across the narrow street. Okay, well, that, that tells you more about the woman and what kind of, you know, uh, road it was that she crossed. Or the businesswoman ate up the concrete in her stiletto pumps. You know, so, so use very precise words when you're writing. Uh, make sure that um, it's, it's as specific as you can get. Those are great examples. And piggybacking on that, tip 18 is to write concisely. So that means using, especially when you're talking about description, fewer words, but more explicit words. Um, practicing with poetry is a great idea because you have to say a lot, create imagery, create meaning in poetry with very few words typically. Um, but the point is that you want to use strong nouns and verbs rather than many adjectives and adverbs when you're writing in fiction in particular. So for example, you could say the old rundown house, or you could be much more concise and say the shack. 
you could say the enormous elegant house or be much more concise and say the mansion or the estate or the chateau. Each one evoking a particular image for the reader because you've chosen something that is really much more descriptive. Um, a mean and violent man could be a brute or a thug. Um, somebody that is driving fast, maybe they raced or they sped down the street. Um, speaking loudly, hollered, barked. So trying to eliminate those adjectives and adverbs and sticking very closely to stronger nouns and stronger verbs. Uh, one thing I've heard about writing concisely that, that <laughs> is good practice is um, screenwriting because in screenwriting the dialogue has to be pretty concise and precise, yeah. both, both things, um, because they don't have a lot of room. Like the dialogue always has to matter in, in screenwriting. So I actually heard um, a guy talking about it once about um, you know, some Clint Eastwood movie where he's, somebody asked, you know, what was your childhood like? And the Clint Eastwood character just responds, short. And think <laughs> how much that conveys in that one word. He could have said, well, you know, I came up in an abusive family and I had to grow up too fast. But if just saying that his childhood was short conveyed so much in one concise word. Right. Okay, so we're, we're down to number 19 now. We're getting toward the end here. So the next uh, tip is to avoid cliches. And the reason why you want to avoid cliches is because things that, that have been said the same way over and over again, they don't really catch our, our attention and they're not fresh. Okay, so the first time somebody said, I need that, like I need a hole in the head, everybody probably thought, wow, what a clever way to say that. Well, we, <laughs> that that. we don't even think about it, a hole in the head anymore. Um, but you can use cliches in a fresh way if you twist them on their head, like instead of saying, it's raining cats and dogs, you know, it's raining um, tigers and wolves or something like that. And sometimes you can do that for a humorous effect or if life will be <laughs> trade them for limes and make margaritas, you know, something like that. But generally you want to avoid cliches. And I, I personally love this tip because I think that's the hardest part is coming up with, and which goes into the next tip, the rhetorical devices, um, ways to enhance your writing creatively because I think we all tend to fall back on those cliches. So I love this tip and I hadn't thought about really turning something on its head like the, the lemonade, you know, instead of making lemon lemonade from lemons, the make margarita, get, you know, choose limes and make margaritas. Um, I, I hadn't thought about it that way. And so now I'm totally going to use that that method, that tack to try and, you know, make it more fresh for me, for my writing. Um, all right. And so our last <clears throat> tip is rhetorical devices. And we're going to go back and forth because there are quite a few rhetorical devices that you can employ with your writing. Um, <clears throat> rhetorical devices are all about style and, and what you bring to your writing that makes it unique, that makes it original and makes that writing come off the page for the readers. So it's not really what you say as much as how you say it. And using these rhetorical devices gives you a method um, or opportunities to, to phrase things and say things in a different way. Um, all right, so for example, have you, has anybody out there studied music? If you have, then you know that music leans on patterns, certain notes, rhythms, um, things that sound together and things that don't, which then would be discordant. Writing is exactly the same. So you can use patterns, um, you can use devices, you can um, change your writing around, turn cliches on their heads, all to make your writing come alive. Um, so we're going to give you, we're going to go back and forth and give you a bunch of rhetorical devices for you to tap into. The first one, I'm going to let you do this in Diane because it has the Chevy truck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's basically just, you, you know, comparison using um, like or as. And one of my favorite examples of this was the old Chevy commercials that they had from a few years ago where they, they said Chevy like a rock. And I always thought, wow, that's that's really good because I could say, you know, Chevys are durable and long lasting and tough and, and heavy and strong. But that's not nearly as effective as saying Chevy like a rock. So that, right. that was an example of that. So um, the similes are a good example of a uh, rhetorical device. Okay, and then hand in hand with similes go metaphors, um, which is instead of a direct comparison, it's an implied comparison. So you could say she's made of ice, rather than saying she's as cold as ice, which would be a cliche, as well as a simile. Um, she's made of ice communicates very clearly what her state of mind or what her persona is, what her personality is, depending on what's going on in the scene. So a metaphor is that implied comparison. Yeah, those could be very effective. Another rhetorical um, device is alliteration, and that's basically just repeating the same sound um, at the beginning of several words in a sentence. So, you know, some of these we think of tongue twisters like sh, sh, 
she sells seashells at the seashore, but you can, you know, say things in other ways, like he was smart, sophisticated, and savvy. Well, that sounds better than just saying he was, you know, intelligent, um, uh, clever, you know, it just doesn't flow as well, but the smart, sophisticated, and savvy just sounds, you know, really good together. Businesses do this to be catchy. That's why we have Dunkin' Donuts, Best Buy, Bed Bath & Beyond, PayPal, Coca-Cola, Lululemon, Chuck E. Cheese, Krispy Kreme, because the, it's catchy. So when you say things um, and when you use alliteration, your, your phrasing is going to sound catchy. Yeah, it makes you remember it, definitely, mm -hmm. or it makes it easier to remember. Um, the next rhetorical device is anaphora, which is repeating the same word or phrase at the beginning of successive clauses or line. Not something that you're going to use a whole lot in fiction unless you are having somebody speak. Um, give a speech, um, speak in a way that they're trying to make a point of something. That would be a, a time that you might use it in fiction. But a good example is Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. So he begins each of the four or five um, uh, clauses or you know paragraphs of that a very powerful speech with I have a dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up. I have a dream that one day the Red Hills of Georgia, you know, uh, each part begins with that phrase which makes it incredibly powerful and if you had a politician in your um in your in your book that you're writing and they're going to give some sort of a speech or talking you know as a politician might then this might be a place that you would use anaphora and kind of the flip-flop of that is anistrophe which is repeating the same word or phrase at the end of a sentence or clause so um franklin roosevelt many many years ago when the war was going on he gave a speech and he used the same phrase without warning at the end of several sentences this is what he said 10 years ago japan invaded machuco without warning in 1935 italy invaded ethiopia without warning in 1938 hitler occupied austria without warning so that repetition of the without warning is the style there the rhetorical device that that uh, just kind of makes it sound better yeah, and I think it gives power to whatever is being said. So, you know, you, you wouldn't use that just all the time and probably not multiple times within a book, but with one character when they're trying to make some sort of important statement or come across, you know, powerfully, that would be when you might use something like that. Um, a synod, how do you say this? A syndeton, I think. <laughs> In writing, I've never heard it said. So, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I was an English teacher, too. <laughs> is a lack of conjunctions between phrases, clauses, or words. So, for example, John F. Kennedy says, we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the sur survival and the success of liberty. He doesn't put ors or ands in there. So this rhetorical device, again, is about creating power in the words that you're putting together. So you can choose not to use this conjunction um, not between your different phrases intentionally to create power in the words that are being spoken. That's a good one. Another one is euphemism, and that's basically substituting a more agreeable phrase or word for one that's, you know, maybe a little uncomfortable for people. Like instead of saying, you know, somebody died, we might say they kicked the bucket or they're pushing up daisies. Um, you know, for old age, we might say they're in their twilight years. Um, you know, if somebody's not real smart, we might just say they're not the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, we, we actually did this for, for walking our dogs because if we say walk, the dogs go nuts. They know what that word means. And even the, my shepherd has even learned when we spell W-A-L-K. So now we've had to try to start saying, do you want to bake a potato? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know what that means, but my husband and I know that means walk the dog. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. Say too loud in here because they'll start barking at me. I know, mine will, mine will hear. They know that word too. Yeah, and so euphemisms are are typically metaphors. Just you know, it's another word to say metaphor, but with a different intent, right? Because you're replacing an uncomfortable thing with something that's you know a different way of phrasing it. Um, uh, comedic effect for humor too. When I, I teach a class on writing humor and that's one of my um, uh, tips is to use euphemism. So you can come up with a really funny, funny substitute phrase for something and that can be humorous. Yeah, and it really, it's a test to your creativity because some of those would be cliches too. So, but if you come up with something original that's clear in meaning, that could be fun too. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, hyperbole, hyperbole, or as middle schoolers like to say, hyperbole, 
that's a hard word to get them to say correctly, like I say that from experience, um, is extreme exaggeration. So, you know, I, my, my feet are going to fall off from walking so much. Well, not really. So it's extreme exaggeration. I had to walk 100 miles today. Not really but you know, extreme exaggeration. So hyperbole is that exaggeration that's emphasizing a point, whatever that point is. Another one is onomatopoeia, which we touched on earlier, and that's basically just using words that imitate sound. So, you know, sputtering, puttering, banging, slam, uh, things like that. Those can be very effective. Um, and, that, and that's using your senses again. So these things all kind of tie in together, you know, because yeah. that's using your sense of sound. Yeah, they really do. Um, personification is attributing personality or traits to something that's non-living. So, for example, in um, and this is going back to bringing your um, your writing alive through showing versus telling. You might say the chair cried out as he sat down. You know, because what, and you're implying that okay, he's heavy for that chair. Um, the trees whispered in the wind. So it's showing, not telling, but you're actually using personification as a method to do that. And I think that's it can be really effective too in things where setting is so important um, because mm -hmm. yeah it's kind of the setting you know the inanimate things alive. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, solipsis is our final rhetorical device, and there there are more of these than we've gone over. So I just say Google them, Google the word rhetorical devices, and you'll see that there's even more. But these are the main ones. But solipsis is using one word. Um, for, in two different ways, uh, two different meanings. So an example from Benjamin Franklin, this was a speech he gave during the um, American Revolution to inspire soldiers. She said, we must all hang together or surely we will hang separately. So he's using hang in two different ways. Um, I have a book called Busted that I wrote. It's got a female motorcycle cop. She's just gotten divorced, moved back to her small town and she really would like to meet a guy, but it's you know a small town. There's just not a lot of prospects. And she says, the problem wasn't a lack of eligible men. The problem was they were eligible for social security, food stamps, or parole. So I use eligible in two different senses there. So It takes a great deal of cleverness to come up with that, that particular rhetorical device. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, some, some of these things are going to require some thought, but it's going to make your writing really shine in, in your use of language. You know, language is our artistic tool here, just like painters use paint and, and uh, sculptors use clay. You know, we're using our words as our clay and our paint. So you want to make sure that you use your words to best effect. And um, if you if you want to know more information about us, um, you can find me at DianeKelly.com. It's spelled um, just like this, D-I-A-N-E-K-E-L-L-Y.com. I'm also on uh, Facebook. I have an author page there, author Diane Kelly, and would love to get in touch with you guys if you want to get in contact um, and wish you all the best in your writing. And then you can reach me at melissabourbon.com, bourbon just like the drink. Thanks, Dad, for that last name. <laughs> That's really my maiden name. Um, and then also Diane and I run an online book club on Facebook. So it's Facebook um, and look for groups, and it's the Book Warriors. So if you like to read mysteries especially, that's what we focus on. We just talk books all day, every day. Um, we do monthly um, book club featuring a particular book. So this month we're featuring Diane's book, um, Dead as a Dead in the Doorway. And then next month we're featuring Dorinda Jones. Some of you may have heard of her, A Bad Day for Sunshine. And then we have a different book each um, month. So look for us on Facebook um, as The Book Warriors. Thank you guys so much for being here. We hope that you learned something from our writing tips.